Well, I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. The last time we got to sit down and do a fireside chat was at CES. I remember I, I walked yeah. by the Luxo booth. I saw Sarah. I go, is, is Marjorie here? And yeah, yeah. And so you <laughs> came on stage and you did the final fireside chat with me for the Metaverse Talks at CES. And um, I just love how you articulate uh, your perspective. I love what your team has done at Luxo and certainly the mater- dematerialized. And that's what we'll talk a bit about today. But for those that may not know who you are, uh, please introduce yourself to the NFT NYC community. Amazing. Thank you, Ian. It's always so cool to get to hang out and chat with you. So I'm very, very excited about this. So I'm Marjorie Hernandez. Uh, I'm a Venezuelan born Germany based entrepreneur. I like building things. That's like the things that I like to do. Uh, I co-founded two ventures, Luxo being one of them, where my co-founder was just now talking with you, Ian. And then I founded a second venture, which is our focus for today, which is the Dematerialize, which is, we believe, the first world's first NFT, fashion NFT marketplace. Uh, we, we incorporated in March of 2020, and we launched in December of 2020 out of London. And yeah, we have an incredible team, like living in the edge between fashion, web free and gaming. So it's a very exciting space where we operate from. I, I've learned a lot about fashion, not just from you, but from like the articles that you're in and the features oh. that you t- And I'm like, oh, there's Marjorie. <laughs> okay. And then I, I read, I'm like, okay, I'm learning more about fashion. One of the things that you, that you shared with me is the line between the physical world and the metaverse with augmented reality, the ability to buy a fashion from the dematerialized uh, use it in multiple metaverses, but also have those clothes, those shoes, those glasses uh, on in the real world through augmented reality. Can you tell us a bit about where is the state of things today? What's possible today? And then where might we be going over time? Oh, wow. That's an awesome question. And I think we're in a super interesting point in time because we still like remember, some of us remember the world before this juxtaposition became so, so clear as it is now. And I think we're moving towards a future like with that juxtaposition between physical and digital reality is going to be an absolute blur. And the best way I find to describe it is kind of like a lucid dream. I think we're going to be in this perpetual state of a lucid dream because we will be experiencing and seeing all of these magical things of this enhanced reality in a common base. Or in like, to perpetuity like have like at all times and I think it's a very beautiful kind of like uh happening and I think you know some people are really afraid of this vision of the metaverse and people ask how many metaverse users are gonna have and how many people are gonna be in the metaverse and it's like well whatever amount of users the internet has and whatever amount of hours you're spending in the in the internet right now just multiply that x and that that's your number, right? And understanding that that vision of the metaverse is nothing but the next iteration of the internet. It's just basically the internet truly, truly breaking free from the two-dimensional surface that has been limited so far. And from that one place that you go and you can exit. And I think like basically being in that in that constant interaction of the presence and, and juxtaposition of both realities we're moving towards. So I think the metaverse is one place. It's not several, it's one destination uh, and it's constituted by all of these different experiences converging together. You know, like the worlds of gaming, we grew up playing video games and, you know, we were told by our parents, now stop, you have to do your homework or you have to eat dinner. <laughs> so long to those times. Right. I think, you know, we are really, we're really, we're really living in that, in that juxtaposition, you know, and then obviously games become more immersive. And I think, you know, there might be certain parts of our life that are truly gamified and which are constantly in and out from those from those experiences. So in terms of if we go back to fashion, you know, obviously we get dressed every day. We express ourselves by the accessories that we wear, like you, like your amazing glasses, or, you know, I always wear these type of tops and things like that. We truly express ourselves. And as the more time we spend in, in this juxtaposition and in these virtual environments, we want to do exactly the same thing. So I think obviously we're still a few steps behind having that true vision of the metaverse in which you potentially could see me now wearing some super cool glasses that I only allow you to see where my mom sees me wearing something else. I think we are might be a few years before that, but I think we are right now in the moment when we are laying the foundation for those things, where we are truly 
kind of like shaping that future and actively co-creating it. And I think everybody who is building a venture, working on the staff, creating content, creating products is really contributing to that vision of the future. So I see ourselves a little bit like the MIT Media Lab kids in the 80s, basically strapping TVs to their heads with the vision of having a VR headset and then Palmer Lucky a few decades later really achieved that vision with a portable VR headset. I think we're kind of in there. So I think this is the inception of what is going to be a very normalized future. The normalized future. Do you think the fashion world is ready for the future of normal where all these things <laughs> merge together? Who in the fashion world is receptive? Is the fashion yeah. media world receptive? Is the biggest brands in the world receptive? Are the greatest designers in the world receptive? Does it depend on who they are? Does it matter what language they speak or where they are from? Help us understand how is the fashion world today responding to this change and what can they do to respond better and to be a part of this future that's coming, whether they are a part of it or not? Amazing. Well, they better be part of it and they better be receptive and ready. Otherwise, they're not going to have a business and then so long to them. Uh, yet again, I think, you know, we are, we are, I mean, in my experience, I think the fashion industry is really open and perceptive. I think they did learn their lesson from like, the web doing, which they thought e-commerce was not going to happen for them. And then all of a sudden it, it did happen. Like we all do it. And those are things that are not mutually exclusive. It's not like either you buy online or you buy in the real world. Like those things tend to inform each other. A lot of people use e-commerce just as a product finding process. And then they discover products online and then they go and shop in the store. So they really inform each other, they complement each other. So I think because they underestimated the power of e-commerce, now they're open and they're like, okay, this is what's happening to us again. And I think they 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 lost some of the that cynicism that it was part of like of the fashion industry. And I think obviously there's also a part that is represent a tremendous financial opportunity. Like I think the value creation that we are experiencing and that we are going to experience is going to be the biggest in the history of humanity. I think it's just unprecedented. And it's the first time they can actually take their beautiful products and enter exponential growth. Like they know it, fashion, they do make a lot of money, but it comes to a high cost, environmental, humanitarian, et cetera. And obviously in order to achieve those amazing numbers that we see tech companies achieving, the fashion industry cannot really enter because they cannot enter exponential growth. For the first time they can, by dematerializing their products, you know, they can enter that exponential growth. So it's a pretty, it's pretty sexy. So I think that's one of the reasons why they're engaging. Nevertheless, I love, I mean, there's some brands that are incredible and they have managed to navigate decades of heritage and, and tradition and craftsmanship, et cetera, which I love, but I'm personally more excited about the insane amount of talent we're going to see entering the market. Brands and creators, who are just, we, we don't know about it right now, but they're going to enter the market by the fact that we just democratize the entry of the market by digitizing it, right? And in that process, anybody with an internet connection in a 3D software can enter the market in a global scale. We're going to see that happening. The same that happened for content creation will happen for fashion. And then you will have very young creators achieving evaluations of billions of dollars in very short period of times. I think, you know, artifacts, studios might be the first of those cases that we see in achieving this insane success and kind of like cultural impact and then all of a sudden you will have players that you wouldn't have anymore you wouldn't have otherwise right like we've been limited quite frankly in terms of talent to very people from very specific geographical locations because it was just complex to enter the industry because if you were not close to one of the biggest capitals you couldn't participate and now we're saying that's not the case anymore as long as you have can connect to the internet, you can gain access. And I think all of that talent that we're about to see is going to make the world a much more exciting place. It is, it's getting more and more exciting yeah. every day, every yeah. week, every month. Uh, for this future, designers are not the only people that are needed to create this. Technologists are needed, yeah. marketers are needed, operators yeah. are needed. Can you talk a bit about the talent that's most needed, the skill sets that are most needed, mm. um, you know, like, who is de the dematerialized recruiting and hiring right now? Uh, the strategic partners that you have, what kind of talent are they looking for? What type of skills should people in the fashion world 
be considering that they should master so that they can be a part of this future that's being created right now? Oh my God, such a good question. Well, I think uh, 3D artists at large are like someone said, like when I studied architecture a long time ago, I was one of like the geek architects who was obsessed with 3D softwares. I think this is like the era of the 3D creators, parametric designers, uh, people who can do like visual coding and they can code these amazing pieces, like all of those talents that people require. Also animators, CGI artists, these are all talents that super, super require. But I think, um, you know, I think we are moving, like we went through this era of like hyper specialization. And I think we might be now going backwards in terms of like, we might need more of this Renaissance polymath type of characters who understand different parts of the puzzle. Like, people who understand game culture, who understand just culture at large, who can code, who has an amazing eye for aesthetics. I think, you know, I joke with, with one of my friends who's a founder as well, like, oh, I, we wish we could hire like 13 years old kids because they understand the culture that we are addressing better than anybody. So I think it's kind of like being that polymath, like just being very curious and like if you're like something and passionate about something, like just go ahead and do it. Like if it's around like, you know, 3D coding and all of these things tend to juxtapose, you know, there's a lot of like when I was doing a lot of 3D work, eventually I had to get into coding to build some of the stuff that I wanted to model. So I think, you know, as long as you are following your passion and if you are interested and really curious about this stuff, like just get hands on on it. But I think anything around like 3D software, 3D creation and then product, product people, like honestly, like now in the Web3 world, the challenge that we had, that we're facing is because everything has been built by the core technologies that we're really living in a very unfriendly user environment, right? It's not made for ordinary or regular users like us. So I think, you know, a lot of product people who are passionate and understand technology, but they don't understand it. They need to go through phases of translation until, until it can really be adopted. So I think all of that uh, put together. And honestly, like the people who understand Discord are so wanted right now is ridiculous. I think eventually it will be demonetized and it will be normalized and whatever. But I think people who understand Discord are like the holy, holy grails right now as well, which is kind of funny. Yeah. Well, you mentioned young people. Uh, you yeah. know, both you and I have young boys. Um, yes. I have two, nine and 13. I believe your son, is he 12? 11, almost 12. He's 11. Almost 12. So yeah. where is their place in the creation of the future? Uh, how can we as parents empower our kids to be involved, right? We can get them cryptocurrency and put in an account. We can help them buy an NFT. Maybe we can help them launch an NFT. But what are your ideas, especially around the development of the metaverse and fashion for young people, little boys, little girls yeah. to participate in the development of this future, either with their parents or with their auntie and their what uncle or with their Nate, you know, some somebody that will invite them to participate. How can they bring value to this uh, cool. development of the future that we're a part of? That's such a cool question. And quite frankly, I think goes down to, I think for parents to lose the fear of digital technologies, like obviously yeah. I'm younger than most parents in our inner circle of, of friends. A lot of them are really afraid of their kids spending too much time in the computer. I grew up playing video games. I love playing video games. That was my favorite activity to do as a kid. And my mom was kind of like relaxed with me. I was the fourth kid. She was like, hey, hope you go play as many video games as you want. And literally informed most of my career decisions <laughs> and my taste on people. So it's just playing video games. But I think quite frankly, like you can't be like it's too late you can't be afraid of it it's just a new medium just like books once upon a time what a new medium this is just a new medium that we're living and it's everywhere so you want it to be versed and to understand that the environment with safety and all of that but they need to be engaging and i think the best thing you can do is to incentivize your child to don't be a consumer but to be a user and at best being a creator so if your kid loves gaming like introduce gaming engine to them buy them and use them in course. So they start also co-creating. And I think, you know, these are the beautiful things you can do. That as long as your child has access to a computer, they can participate. So just make sure that they are a co-creator, right? Like Joshua, of course, he gets signed to game, but you know, he's also minting NFTs and he's creating skins for Roblox and he's and he has to code and he has to do all of these things. And the moment he understands that 
the beautiful thing about these digital environments is that you can co-create, that you can be a, particip a participant. Like in the physical world, it's quite complex sometimes to build things. In these environments, like you can truly build things that doesn't matter your age. So I think like incentivize them to create and, and actually harvest that's the power of digital technologies. You can pretty much build anything that you can envision. It's super exciting as a kid. So just let them build build and create and co-create especially, right? We still have responsibility with our kids to try and invite them to come alongside us and co-create with us or with 100%. people that we trust. 100%. 100%. Absolutely. If you could talk to the media and you had Time Magazine and the Wall Street Journal and New York Times attention, and they all came and said, okay, what do we need to tell the world about? Digital fashion. Ooh. How would you guide the media to best represent what's happening and where, who would you tell them to talk to? Uh, what organizations would you tell them to do their research on? Uh, if the media came to you, which they already do, <laughs> but if they came to you asking this question, <laughs> then how might you guide yeah. the media to better review and expose the cool things that are happening in the industry right now? Oh, that is such a, such a, such a, good, such a good question. I think you know, first, I mean, obviously they're already talking to me, so they're in great hands, evidently. Um, and I will give them like a list of my friends to talk to, like my co-founder, Karina Grant, Fabian, Benoit Pagotto, like all of the people who are basically building and co-creating in the space, that will be the contact that I will give them. I think in terms of um, how to represent us, I think, you know, one of us humans, basically we've been working to move away from defining value in physical or things that we have harvest from the earth, right? And we start doing that when we start making stories and you know, writing books and making theater plays and movies. Like we are just creating a world that is unrelated to the physical world, that is unrelated to the material values that we can harvest from the earth. So I think understanding that that process of dematerializing things is one of the most natural human processes because it's basically creating the world that exists in our imaginations in this reality to be shared with others um that's what's happening right so when people feel like how, how do you dematerialize fashion in the same way you we have dematerialized everything like we listen to music on our devices we see we read all everything is happening in a digital in a digital way and once digitized is dematerializing not necessarily demonetized, but into a certain extent, it can become demonetized. Um, so I think understanding that, you know, the way we represent ourselves, obviously, the one medium that we had was through fabric and clothes, and that's what we have been doing. But as we progress, that is going to change. And there's a huge value in fashion and the lifestyle space that is not related to the material value. Right. The least reason why people stand in line to buy a Supreme T-shirt is not because of the quality of the costume, right? It's for other other reasons why people are, you know, Patek Philippe and people are waiting for years to get an outfit. Obviously, the mechanics are great, but it, there's also a value around it that it represents something else that is not attached only to the physical components. So I think this is something that we do, but somehow we don't want to be super. Like everybody feels a slightly afraid when something is not physically there. But the fact that it's not physically there doesn't mean that one doesn't exist. So that's why I'm a bit against this whole IRL narrative. I think everything is happening in real life. It's just some are physical and some are not, right? So I think um, understanding that reality goes beyond the physicality of things is, to, is like the main thing around our movement that it goes down to, you know, the whole Web3 and the whole blockchain movement, like dematerializing money because it was already dematerialized, but now we are making it in a way that is fair. So I think understanding that is like the basic principle and then going back that, you know, it's not, these things are not really exclusive. Of course, we will continue to have physical products, but they will fulfill the different purposes, like potentially you just buy them for function, and then everything that you're buying for beauty and enjoyment is happening digitally and things like that. Well, I asked uh, Fabian to share a final word in German. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> I know that he mostly speaks English. I thanked him because <laughs> he does all these talks in English, speaks on stage in English. Most of the people that work for him speak English. And yeah. I just recognize we're a part of a global community. People speak all sorts of languages. They're part of the NFT NYC community. 
if I remember correctly, your initial mother tongue is Spanish. Is that right? That's correct. Six. Yes. And you speak, you speak more languages than yes. Fabian. I think I, you said you speak five? No, no, but kind of. Kind, kind of. of. But I, my, what I speak really well, well, really well, fairly well, is Spanish. It used to be my strongest one yet to be determined if it's really that strong. Uh, English and German. So those are my main, my main uh, languages. So if you'd be willing, I would love for you to speak to the community, just kind of a, a final word of encouragement speak life into them, but speak in Spanish. And they can, it's easy to translate, but it lets you share your mother tongue. It lets people that speak Spanish feel like we are recognizing there's a broad open community. So please share some final thoughts with us in Spanish, if you don't mind. Fantastic. And so many people speak Spanish. And this goes back to our conversation in Vegas around like voice recognition and stuff like that, depending on the different accents. So yes, I would love to speak Spanish. So muchísimas gracias. Ian, por darme la oportunidad de hablar español eh, en, este, en este medio. Pues bueno, can, can, así como recapitulando nuestra conversación, básicamente yo creo que lo más importante y la oportunidad que tenemos todos como comunidad colectivamente es la habilidad de co-crear el futuro, de construir para el futuro y de realmente entender que estamos viviendo en un momento histórico en que potencialmente los sueños no tienen límites y se pueden volver realidad. Así que yo creo que lo mejor que podemos hacer eh, construir y básicamente no tener miedo, ir adelante y, hacer, y ejecutar lo, nuestra visión con ser feroces y, y ambiciosos y ir por ello y bueno, que y, y posiblemente y muy, muy posiblemente tener éxito y ser participantes en el futuro que todos estamos creando juntos. Así que bueno, ya está, eso es todo. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked. I, I actually understood some of your words. Uh, I didn't really understand Fabian. <laughs> I don't really know. I don't but really that, know any German that, at all. But I understood some of your words. It does, doesn't matter the language. That's the case the most of the time. I felt the passion <laughs> both times, though. <laughs> but you're an American guy, and there's so much Spanish happening in America. It's crazy. True. Like every sign is in Spanish and English. Like It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I know, I know. the Spanish is inside. Yeah, we just I've, I've tried out. to learn languages. I just, <clears throat> languages don't stick with me. I moved to Spain for a month one time, Valencia, Spain. I got to Mexico oh. so many times. I just, uh, I even, I even tried so I could go to Puerto Rico. I'm like, I got to learn Spanish to respect the locals. Still struggling with it. But thank you no, for sharing. You, thank you for sharing. You will be able fun. though. I'm sure you can learn Spanish. And the thing is, as an English speaker, everybody speaks English. It's a disadvantage. Right. So I'm yes, sure you can make it. It is. I know, because it makes <laughs> it easy. If I don't, you know, if I feel lazy, I just keep speaking English. Um, okay. I, the final thing I want to ask you about is you just released some three types of rings through yes, the Dematerialized. Can you share what the purpose of these three rings are and how people can find out about them and what the utility. Yeah. I just think it's such a cool approach because you've been releasing yeah. amazing shoes and clothes and, and now there's a utility uh, membership of sorts to this ring. So please share with us yes. what, the, what the purpose of, of that course, was. Of course, of course, of course. So we have the luck of collaborating with this amazing artist, Stefan Sega, which is incredible and I think he should be and he would be hyper hyper famous because it's incredible what they're doing um so basically we, this is our second drop with Teflon there is was a drop yesterday I think something is happening today or tomorrow I'm not really sure about the timing but you know this is really beautiful unique assets and they will give you some access everything that we sell at the dematerialized always comes packed with superpowers how i like to call it every nft comes with an array of utilities for every single drop so you guys have to follow different sega follow the dematerialized and then you guys will get to know exactly what the rings will do for you but they are incredible and teflon is incredible it's out of this world the stuff that, that they are doing so to go check it out. And I think the stuff that with the rings, I think are sold out, but there's some more stuff coming. So go for it. Well, that's why you got to follow everything that's happening with the dematerialized now. So yes. that things don't yes. sell out without you being <laughs> out about them. And there's yes. so many things that uh, Luxo and the dematerialized are doing, that your teams are doing, you're leading the charge yeah. in so many ways. And so I think all of us that are part of the NFT community want to say thank you. 
Thank you for your consistency, for your faithfulness, for your diligence, your hard work. Um, you don't have to keep working necessarily, but you keep doing this for the sake of being creative and developing things that don't yet exist, but are good for humanity. I recognize that. I see that. and I really honor it. So thank you for all that you do as a leader in this industry. Thank you so much, Ian. And thank you for giving this, creating this amazing platform for people to share their ideas and their voice. And as I told you, I enjoy so much every interview, every panel, every podcast. It's incredible. You are a talent. So we're very lucky to have you being part of the Web3 community. Well, I'm for very sure. thankful for that. I look forward to spending time with you and everybody that's watching. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Uh, all of us will be in Times Square, New York. We're going to rent all the billboards in Times Square. <laughs> all of these amazing <laughs> NFTs yeah. will be on the screens. We're going to have all the space and extra parties. I know Luxo is going to come out and have a gathering of sorts. And so I look forward to being a part of whatever it is that you and yeah. your team put together. I want to come. Thank you. I, I well, you, you are always invited. You're always invited. And we're going to have Everybody a me. Of our, eh, de facto, always, for sure. And then the other thing that Immaterialize is, is working on a special drop to happen that, that week. I think it's going to be the 22nd of June. So, And it's okay, an everybody. interesting collaboration. It's an interesting 22nd of June. Let's, let's be yeah. ready for it. Yes. Marjorie, thank you for everything. Thanks for jumping in. Thank you, Ian. Of okay. course, my pleasure. Bye, everybody. <laughs>